uh, as they used to be. Mm. What's going to happen when the children grow up and they leave the nest mm -hmm. and you find yourself with Papa and Mama mm. all along? What are you going to do when change comes? Change affects everyone. But especially this morning, we want to look at how change affects the church. And before we get to our text of Luke, the fifth chapter, we pray for me while I'm up here. I'm throwing the wrong pair of shoes. And that's what we do this flow. So if I go slide across like James Brown, don't blame it on intention. Don't blame it on accident. All right. And uh, we pray that everything will go well this morning. Amen. So I'll take the time. I'm uh, trying to make sure that I don't slip. And everything is all right. Amen. That's what happens when you don't listen to your wife, by the way. And that's another story. <laughs> but I want you to tell your friend, tell your neighbor, that God loves you. And I love you too. Amen. Man, that's a blessing. For getting out of their seat. In order to make sure that hands are, hands are shook. Because love is in the air. And love is in our hearts. What are you going to do when change comes? Our text is taken from Luke, the fifth chapter, verses 36 to verse number 39. And if you're not there, I'll give you time to get there. that you dare you lost. <laughs> we trust the indication that you're there. The text says this morning, then Jesus used this illustration. No one turns off a piece of a new garment to make a patch for an old one. Not only will the new garment be burnt, but the old garment will look worse with a new patch on it. Amen. All them old jeans you got. It may be better to throw them away than to put a patch on it because you look mighty funny walking in the street with, uh, with, uh, with a garment that's old and new at the same time. Uh, amen. And no one puts new wine into old wine skin. For the new wine bursts the old skin, ruining the skin and spilling the wine. New wine must be put into new wine skin. But no one after drinking the old wine seems to want the fresh and the new. For they say the old ways are best. Young man asked his wife on occasion. She was preparing a meal for a family 
gathering. Uh, and his wife cut off the front and the end of the ham, put it in a pan. And the young husband wondered why his wife cut off the end of the ham and put it in a pan. And so he asked her, why do you waste ham by cutting off part of it and throwing it away? She says, it's really not a waste. That what I'm doing is the way my mother always did it. This has become a family tradition of all the cookers and the cooks in the family. So the next time that they visit his mother-in-law, he asked her, why is it that you cut off the front and the end of the hand? And mom said, well, I never own a pan large enough to hold the whole pan. So I cut off the end of it. Sometimes we have traditions passed down to us and we practice them when they make no sense. And if you think about your life and think about your mom's life and your father's life, the time that you were coming up, there were some traditions that were practiced in your house that made no sense. One of them I can think of is that everybody always took a bath on Saturday. <laughs> but don't we smell this bad on Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday, and Friday? But we do it on Saturday because it is a tradition that's been passed down to us. You know, sometimes when we learn how foolish things are, that are passed down to us, we laugh about yeah. This morning I'm going to deal with some tradition that we practice. But we never really give a thought in terms of why we do it. We just simply do it. Because somebody said do it, or because this is the way the mama did it, this is the way the daddy did it. And tradition. All right. And traditions ought to teach us a lesson. And traditions, we need to understand that some are man made, and others are God made. And that we have to be mindful. That what God wants us to understand in this lesson of change, that you don't change my word for your tradition. Mm. Amen. Mm. Amen. Now the command to worship on Sunday is the Lord's command. Mm. What time we worship and how long we worship is a man-made tradition. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Whether we worship an hour, whether we worship two hours, etc. Man-made tradition. The only time when the scene kind of gets a little sticky is when you got an eldership. And I'll get there in a few minutes. Right. Eldership, what do you mean? 
Well, the scripture says, obey the elders that have rule. That means authority. That means carrying out not only God's tradition, but man-made tradition. Mm -hmm. If the eldership agreed that we were going to meet three times on Sunday, we said, well, all you need is one time. Well, I want you to understand something. All day, all day Sunday is the Lord's day. So all day Sunday is the worshiping day. If they made it that, uh, uh, that routine, then some of them will say, well, I ain't going to do it. It just don't make no sense. The problem with that is, when you deal with an eldership, then I'm, I'm just kind of kind of get us home in and get us uh, to the point that we understand what we get into once we, once we install them. Uh, it says that, you know, if you are sick, what do you do? You call the elders. And what do they do? Uh, they can pray for you. They can pray that you be healed. And if you're sin, they can pray that you be forgiven. You know what that tells me? The eldership got power. Mm. And when the Bible says I'm to obey them, that tells me I'm to respect them. That their opinion is not just like anybody's opinion. Their opinion is special when it comes down to the family of God. Just as mother and father are special when it comes down to their house. And they tell their children what they're going and not going to do then that becomes sealed because mama and daddy become the authority. <laughs> and in the Lord's church, when you get elders, elders as a leading body becomes the authority through which the Lord works. And so we have to be very mindful that there are some traditions that must be ignored in face of God's word for them. Right. That in I think uh, Mark the seventh chapter. We'll go over that. Uh, but there is a situation whereby the folk decide that they got mom and daddy to take care of, but they took the money and they promised it to God. Now that they promised the money to God, then how can I take care of my mother, and my father? I'm gonna give it to God. And God makes it very clear. Uh, that you violated my command by your tradition. Mm -hmm. That you made up something and you said you can't do it because you've done something other than what all that symptom means here. I have no excuse for not giving to God. Mm -hmm. I can't say it was on gay. I can't say that it was on my health. I can't say that, well, I, I, I wasn't working. Because even when you don't work, guess what? You get some what? You get some money. You get some favor. That God helps you out, right? And if God helps you out, then he respects you to bow and to submit to his will. In other words, don't change my command for your tradition. Amen. And a lot of times uh, we do that. But be very careful in doing that because we violate the will of Almighty God. But let me get where I need to get while I still can see. Now we learn how fully some commands are by living our lives and by doing those traditions. When I say commands, I'm referring to the idea of the tradition of men. That we make tradition. Amen. But what does the Bible say about tradition? Uh, the Bible excuses some traditions and the Bible honors other traditions. For the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2 and 15, Stand fast, hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now Paul is talking. Now what is Paul talking about? When he's talking about traditions here, he referred to that the uh, apostleship gave the church 
uh, some information in terms of how they were to worship and serve God. And what Paul is saying, that now that I'm gone, you're not free to go ahead and change the tradition. That the tradition is set. Now we can change the time we worship, we can change how long we worship, but we can't change worship. Because worship is something that God commands that you do and I do to his praise, to his honor, and to his glory. Amen. Now Paul, as I said, is speaking about man-made tradition, but he's talking about inspired tradition, and they're inspired because what the apostles said, and what the apostles did, and whom the apostles represented. And the apostles represent the Lord himself. Amen. Amen. And so we need to bear uh, that in mind. Amen. Now, let me give you something here. God's inspired tradition are uh, meant to keep us from ignoring them. Amen. What do you mean? In Exodus, the 20th chapter, and verse 2 8, the Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Bring to mind the Sabbath day. You know why you need to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy? Because if you don't remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, you will remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. That's why. So, in order for us to respect Sunday as a day of worship, the Lord gave us a precursor, if you will, that you remember the Sabbath day, you remember Saturday, and you make sure you keep it holy. Amen. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, and verse number 19, the text says, And he took bread, and gave thanks, and break it, and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Right. Here's another tradition, but it's a what kind of tradition? It's an inspired tradition. Now, God doesn't tell us how many folk do you who we carry out this tradition in the church. What we, what, whether we carry, whether we use five or ten men, that's simply unimportant. What's important is that we remember to partake of the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. Amen. Remember, sister. True story. And I became part of this particular congregation. Uh, not necessarily as a preacher, but simply uh, as one of its members. And I began to notice that after we took the chicken for our supper, that one particular sister always got up. And she left. Come back Sunday, the same thing. But they get a Lord's Supper, she partakes of it, and she's gone. Once she was asked about it, her words were, when well, after the Lord's Supper, worship is ended, I'm not required to stay. And that's where I leave and go home. That this was a congregation with elders. She didn't. She never thought that by her getting up and walking out, that she was disrespecting God, but she was also disrespecting the eldership. And we need to be very careful of what we do once we get elders installed. Let me show some with you. And I get back to you. <laughs> Brother William. Tell me, Brother William. Uh, you walked in the phone. 
And because I love you, I came by to tell you so. And I said, well, brother, let's stay up my business. You ain't got no business at all my business. Now, God might get simply weak at that. But now, let an elder tell me the same thing. Then I tell the elder to get out of my business. Those elders got a direct path to God. That means that there will be some consequences for my disobeying elders. But the scripture makes it very clear we're not to disobey them, but we're to what? We're to honor them. So there is, we have to be careful about traditions that we make and command tradition made by the living God. Now in Genesis 2 and 24, the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. And what? The one, uh, or excuse me, and they shall be one flesh. Without going through all the go through, there are things about marriage we don't completely understand. Mm. That in reality, have you ever noticed? And I, you know, and I noticed that from time to time. I don't be looking for it, but some folks they stay, stay. They've been married so long they begin to look like one another. <laughs> That's some of that woodenness. I mean, they can begin and end one another's sentences. They know all about their spouse. And we have to be mindful that the longer you stay together, more glue or more nails are put in your relationship. And the more nails or the more spiritual glue that's put in your relationship, that means it's harder to break that relationship. And that's why it is that when some folk are unfaithful to the relationship, the other party forgive because they've been with the person so long they cannot imagine their life without them. Amen. <clears throat> but that's true. That don't cost you anything. But now let me share of this with you. God commands us worship. And we worship according to his blessed will. God commands us to sing. But he also commands us to make melody where? To make melody in our heart. So as long as the singing and as long as the music is made in our heart, we have no problem with God. But we're looking at some of God's tradition and saying, you know what? That means I can add anything to sing. You know, I can, I can put the piano in there. I can put the guitar in there. Uh, and nobody can say anything because it's coming from my lips. But the Lord said the music is to be made in your heart. Little by little. If we are not careful that we would drift away from God's commandments and God's traditions. Amen. Let me share this with you. I don't want you to get the idea that observing special days don't have a place in your life and don't have a place in mine. Observing birthdays and anniversary is all fine. But don't take your birthday, don't take your anniversary and make an excuse. That's why I couldn't come back to worship. It was my anniversary. What's more important your anniversary of God's command? We have to understand that it's God's command. Amen. I don't have to preach every Sunday, but I sure look at the worship every Sunday. All right. Now let me share this with you while you see here before me. Sometimes that our tradition can separate us from serving and worshiping God. All right. What that basically means is that 
My tradition to you is my birthday. And so I want to enjoy my birthday. And that's fine. But what happened when Winston rolls around and the elders you had said that we we're going to come and study the Bible on Wednesday? Does it become optional or is it a command? It becomes a command for that assembly, not necessarily for all assembly, because we function individually. And that we have to make up our mind that we are going to follow the commands of God rather than our own tradition. You remember, David, that David wanted to move the ark uh, into Jerusalem. Uh, and he put it on a cart. Uzzah was nearby. And the oxen stumbled. The ark, uh, the, uh, the ark <coughs> began to fall. So Uzzah, without any thinking of evil, did what was natural. He put up his hand to block the ark from falling, and God struck him dead. Now why did God do that? To remind us that when it comes down to his commandments and our tradition, that we obey the commandments, yeah. amen, rather than the tradition. Yeah. So you got a lot of tradition. You know, you might like to wear, you know, jeans on Sunday. Matter of fact, one of these Sunday maybe we have a jean Sunday. Or we just got a dress counter. I don't have a problem with, with all of that. But the eldership has basically said, look, we want you to, want you to, to, to dress a presentable uh, want. Uh, you to watch how uh, you wear your clothes and your clothes are not too tight or too loose or whatever the case might be. Now they give me uh, some instruction. I decide, well, I don't care what they have to say. I'm coming in here with my sandals on. I'm coming in here with my shorts on. Now what's going on here? Who tradition am I following? Don't be quiet. I'm following my own tradition, not following the Lord's tradition. Uh, because when God works through, like when God worked through the apostleship, the apostleship had the responsibility to convey God's heart to the people's heart. Amen. And we have to be mindful of that when it comes down to God's word, that we bow into submission to it rather than to reject it. The Bible says uh, in Matthew, uh, the Bible says, obey the elders, this is human, this is Hebrews 13, 17. Obey the elders that have rule, that is strength, power, or leadership over you, and submit yourself, for they watch for your soul. So the eldership got a unique responsibility to talk right, to live right, because they're watching for whose soul? They're watching for my own. And I recall that the other day. I was driving and that was a good sign to stop. Man, this thing was blinking. But it was out of place. I never observed the stop time before. So was that a new place. Man, I ran straight through that, that sign. Yeah. Even though the light was blinking, because I was following my tradition of going through that intersection and wasn't following the sign. Man, just happened to blow at me. Uh, pulled out the window and said, don't you know you, you, uh, you went through that stop sign? And I'm thinking, you know, not in, uh, yes and no, but I really didn't mean to. Then I got to thinking, you know, I'm glad he stopped me. Because I could have ran through a stop sign and killed someone. We have to understand that we got a responsibility not to hold to our tradition, but to hold to God's tradition. Amen. 
Now the Bible says, oh, let me share this with you. And then I'm going to oh, bring this to a Have you ever noticed that we buy his when we pray? Have you ever found anywhere in the Bible where folk bow their head when they pray? Mm. Mm. You may find one day. But the majority of the Jews then bow their head and close their eyes when they pray. Close their eyes when we pray, basically, not a tradition that God has commanded. We have brought that tradition on. Now at home. Now I close my eyes. Why? Because I don't want to be distracted from other stuff. And so when we stand and pray, nobody has to tell me to close my eyes. I don't want to close my eyes. And uh, the only time I don't close my eyes when I'm driving and I'm praying to God. Amen. That's a bad combination. <laughs> Amen. Amen. In my office is where I do most of my prayer. I don't pray all over the house. Uh, I got one special spot in my office that I normally go to when I pray. But you know what, when I'm in my office, I don't always close my eyes. You know why? It's nothing distracting me. So why am I closing my eyes for? Nothing is distracting me. I'm still honoring God. I'm talk talking directly to Him. We have to understand that certain Tradition are brought about by the leadership of the church to help the church to become closer and more dedicated to God. Right. They ask us to stand. Well, why am I standing? I'm standing because I respect God. If I'm going to stand when the president comes in the room, I'm going to stand when God's in the room. All right? And we have to understand that. We have to begin to uh, disciple some of the stuff in our lives. Some of the things we got are traditional and some of those things we got are not traditional, but they're commanded by the will and by the word of Almighty God. Now, there is something else in closing that I want to share with you. And that is Close my eyes may have the effect that we are ignoring God rather than honoring God. And we have to make sure in our hearts that when we close our eyes, and matter of fact, you know what? Kneeling down and worshiping God. It's never been a commandment to the church. That is a man-made tradition, but we do it in order to honor God. So is it wrong to stand while you pray? Is it wrong to stand or to kneel when you pray? Of course not. Because we're giving honor and praise to Almighty God. Amen. Amen. We have to understand that the God that we serve is a God of power. Yes. Let me share this with you. Music that touches one generation does not always touch another generation. Yeah. You know why folk are adding stuff uh, in the groups and even sometimes in the singing? Because they're trying to touch other generations. See, what encouraged me, oh, how I love Jesus, may not necessarily encourage another generation. Mm -hmm. And so we have generations making changes because they're trying to reach out and touch other generations. But well, let me share this with you. Just because God has to work a certain way in your life, mm -hmm. it don't mean that God can't work a certain way or a different way in your life. Mm -hmm. See, we don't have the last word on God. We don't tell God what he can do and what he can't do. Mm -hmm. If God wants to perform a miracle, amen, he can perform a miracle. Mm -hmm. If you want to bring about a change in my life through a song, 
that some man has made mm. will praise God. Mm. Hallelujah. Because God's power is at work in our lives. Amen. And I think what I'm really trying to say, brothers and sisters, is that change is going to come. Mm. But don't get all a bit of a huff and a puff mm. when change comes. Mm. Learn how to accept change mm. and learn to realize mm -hmm. that as long as change is not violating the word of God, go ahead and change. Amen. Some things we've been doing for years, mm. some things our family have been doing for years, and we need to make a change, but we're afraid to make a change because that's the way we've always done it. Amen. But we have got to say mm. that when change comes, mm. that change is going to bring about a blessing to our lives. Let me share some more. In Matthew, no, Malachi 3, verse number 6, he said, I'm the Lord. I change now. What yeah. God is saying to you, yeah. not that I never change, but because I am a consistent God, that everything I do, everything I do rather, is consistent with my path. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you can trust God. Now, if God gives way to change, then why can you? Go to another congregation and they got something going on different than our and you, still, you get a huff and a puff. Mm. And all it is is a tradition. Mm. See, no matter what you sing with, I can still praise God with my lips. Mm. Oh, yeah. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. Then I don't have to follow you. As long as I'm praising God with my lips in my heart, I'm obeying the word of God. So what I'm saying is, loosen up. Yeah. 2017. <laughs> and don't believe that everything that you see, mm. everything that you experience, yeah. is a violation of God's will. Yeah. Because in many cases, we are imposing man's will right. where God's will should abide and exist. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 And come in too close. Allow me to say that the Bible says in 1 John 4 and verse 2 11, the word says, Beloved, uh, that is, believers, trust not every spirit, mm. uh, but try mm. that is, test, mm -hmm. approve the spirit, mm. for the way of God. Mm. Because many false teachers mm -hmm. have gone out into the world. Mm -hmm. And what that text tells me, that wherever I go and whatever I hear, yes. my responsibility is not to stand up and say, y'all wrong. Mm -hmm. Y'all doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. My responsibility is to check the word of God. Mm -hmm. To make sure that I'm walking according to the word of God. Yeah. And I'm not talking according to my tradition, but I'm speaking according to inspired tradition that's found in the Word of God. We have to be very mindful. I remember David. You know, David broke God's command concerning the chivalry. David was hungry. He was running from Saul. And he went into the temple and ate what? Show the showbread. Yep. Yeah, show which was not acceptable in the sight of God. Mm. But God didn't condemn him. God didn't kill him. Mm. You know why? Because the commands of God have all, always been made to help us and not hinder us. Mm. Feeding David when he was hungry was to help David. That he might continue on his way and remain and escape ye from Saul. Mm. And we have to understand that when it comes down to any of God's commandments, we have to understand this, that they were written in order to help. Mm. What does that mean? That means that I'm on the way to the worship service. 
with Brother Moe's on the side of the highway, got a flat tire. What did I say? Well, hey, brother, see you at worship. <laughs> no, if you love your brother, if you love God, if you understand tradition, that traditions are made spiritually to help brother hinder, you stop and you help your brother. Amen. Or you take your mom to the uh, emergency room, and after the emergency procedure is over, then you come to worship. Amen. We need to stop comparing the old to the new. We need to stop comparing our old wife to our present wife. Why? Well, she wasn't better, you were never married. Mm -hmm. So you know she's better. Mm -hmm. So let that be that. What about comparing one child to another? Mm -hmm. Well, understand that Jacob and Esau mm -hmm. were born to travel different routes. Same daddy, same mom. But Jacob was rebellious he was disobedient. He had no trust, no real faith in God in his young life. Mm -hmm. But just because Jacob was that way, Esau had a problem too. Esau was deceived. And you no know, changes came in both Jacob's life and Esau's life, but it took time to bring about a change. And what I'm saying to you and I'm saying to me is some stuff you got in your life, some traditions you got in your life is not going to change overnight. It's going to take time to bring about a change. And we have to realize that God can bring about the change if we continue to trust in God and we walk by faith. Amen. And not by sight. I want to encourage you this morning that if you don't know who the Lord is, the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that died on the cross of Calvary. He's the one that shed his blood on that cross. He's the one that said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's the one that died and left the apostles to work and to establish the church. We have to make up our mind that we're going to love Jesus more than the word and the tradition of me. We are going to make up our minds this morning that we are going to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We are going to repent of every sin. We are going to confess Christ to be the Lord of our lives. And then we are going to be baptized and have our sins washed away. And when we were baptized, our sins are washed away. According to Acts 22 and verse number 16, we are added to the body, we are added to the church. We encourage you to come because change is going to come. And change is knocking on some of your door, even right now, won't you come as we've got to stand and sing the Savior's invitation.